Hello, everybody. I'm Shinobi from Bitcoin Magazine, sitting down with Robin Linus from ZeroSync and also the creator of BitVM. I guess we're going to sit here and talk a little bit today about the current state of BitVM. So um, <clears throat> you just told me before uh, we sat down that <clears throat> you have a feature freeze on a final implementation. How long until mainnet, sir? <laughs> uh, good question. Maybe first of all, I should give a shout out to the BitVM Alliance. Um, we created um, this alliance of uh, all the companies, of all the L2 companies that want to build on top of BitVM. We've been working on um, that bridge implementation, in particular the Snark Verifier, for a bit more than half a year now. And um, yeah, it has been a great collaboration. And um, we have finished the first implementation of the Snark Verifier, did a code freeze, and now in May the uh, security audits will start then hopefully if no crazy bug comes up, um, we can go live on mainnet. All right, so just for people who might be a little out of touch, uh, you know, it's kind of faded out of the limelight a little bit since everybody put their heads down actually working on it. Uh, do you want to kind of give like a quick breakdown, I guess, of like the original BitVM proposal mm -hmm. and then um, kind of jump to BitVM2 and the differences between them um, that were created, I guess, to optimize use as a bridge mechanism? The main difference between BitVM1 and BitVM2 was um, that in BitVM1, verification was permissioned. That means during setup, you had um, to define a particular set of verifiers or challengers who um, could challenge malicious claims. So if, if some operator um, wanted to steal from the bridge, then they were like, let's say, 100 challengers who could prevent that. And from a security point of view, that is, of course, suboptimal because um, if there's a lot of money in the bridge, you, you could like bribe all these challenges not to challenge you. And um, that was yeah, quite a suboptimal um, situation. So we thought about how to get rid of these permission challenges. The key idea was that in BitVM1, you had multiple rounds. So mm -hmm. essentially, the operator made a claim and then um, a challenger could ask clever questions and um, the operator has to respond to each question and um, then uh, the, operator, uh, the, the challenger kept asking clever questions to disprove the operator. And um, the problem here was that if um, just somebody else would keep on asking the questions, they could ask dumb questions which would not lead to um, a disproof. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why it had to be permissioned. In BitVM2, we got rid of all of that altogether by just um, reducing the protocol to a single round protocol at the expense of essentially more data. You know, in, in like the, the unhappy path, you had to post, you have to post more data on chain, but um, challenging becomes completely permissionless, so everybody can become a challenger. Everybody who has a stake in the sidechain and who has like, an incentive um, to keep the side system um, secure, they can um, start a challenge. And um, yeah, that drastically uh, improves the security guarantees. Since now, um, yeah, you have as long as there is somebody who who, who starts a challenge, the, the the system is secure more or less. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, this is mostly kind of I guess being built out by roll-up teams. But I know you in particular had a different kind of goal in mind in terms of what type of system you wanted to use BitVM to, to bridge into. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, your original proposal was the ZK Coins proposal, but that's kind of evolved into the full client side validated system um, that you did with Liam and Jonas, I believe. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you want to kind of talk a little bit about how you see that working as something to take advantage of BitVM as an alternative to rollups? Like on a high level, um, I keep saying I'm in it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> I want Bitcoin to be used as cash, as electronic cash, as uh, in the title of the white paper. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think for that, we need essentially three things. We need um, better scalability, we need better privacy and better usability. And um, ZK coins or like that shielded CSV protocol, it tackles both privacy and scalability. It's like the privacy is, is comparable to Zcash or to other state-of-the-art protocols. Mm -hmm. And um, from the scalability point of view, it improves on-chain scalability by roughly a factor of 10. So we can process about a bit more than 100 transactions per second on the base layer. Mm -hmm. 
also it makes transactions cheaper. The, the key idea behind that is to use so-called client-side validation, which um, is actually a, quite an old idea. I think there is a post from Peter Todd from 2014, mm -hmm. where he started talking about client-side validation in general. But already back then, he mentioned that um, if he would combine client-side validation with uh, zero-knowledge proofs, then it would become quite neat or like pretty pretty efficient and also private. And um, back then, there were no proof systems that were good enough. Or like It was just a theoretical thing back then. Mm -hmm. It was really... Um, not sure back then, but um, nowadays we, we have all kinds. We, we live in that Cambrian explosion of proof systems, and proof systems become faster every day and uh, like more efficient to prove, and um, the privacy is great. And uh, so um, now the time is ripe to actually implement that original vision of, of Peter Todd. Mm -hmm. And um, I noticed that back in 2012 when we were working on um, a chain state proof where we applied zero knowledge proofs um, to essentially running, running, running a light client or to um, compressing, or like to making syncing more efficient. Mm -hmm. And um, it was kind of like an obvious application when I saw other protocols like RGB or ta uh, Taproot assets that um, these protocols would become drastically better if you would just apply zero knowledge proofs to them. And that is for two reasons. Um, first of all, um, in these client-side validation protocols, it works such that um, I, as the sender, send you, the recipient, a coin proof, which is essentially a proof of the entire history. It contains all of the previous transaction, uh, which essentially make that coin valid. And you, as the recipient, you are the one who is incentivized to um, check that entire history to prove to yourself that this coin is actually valid and carries value. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that um, this history grows quasi exponentially. Like every transaction has at least one input. So on average, it has more than one input. And um, so you have that entire tree of ancestor transactions that you have to verify. Pretty quickly, the history becomes like gigabytes. And um, that kind of like defeats the purpose because yeah. at the supermarket cashier or something, you don't want to transfer two gigabytes of data before. Yeah, it's like you... downloading a movie to, to make a payment. Yeah. So that's a bit absurd in the classical CSV model. Um, to be fair, Taproot assets, uh, the, their argument is that they will mostly use it in, in Lightning channels. So there won't be many actual transactions, uh, on-chain transactions. Most of the transactions will happen just off-chain in, in Lightning channels. Mm -hmm. So you could say the, the history doesn't grow that much, but um, still they have that problem. And over time, the history will grow a lot. And the second thing is that um, it's just not private. It's just as um, like the, the transaction graph and also the values are just as obvious as in, in regular Bitcoin. You could make an argument that it's not obvious to everyone. It's only obvious to the recipient, but the recipient sees the entire Yeah, that, that, that passes along as the coin moves. Yeah. So everybody, as they transact, kind of have the history of different coins revealed yeah. to them over time. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is um, when, you, when you apply zero-knowledge proofs, um, first of all, these zero-knowledge proofs give you perfect privacy. Well, they verify that entire history within that zero-knowledge proof, and that zero-knowledge property um, hides the entire transaction graph and the values, which essentially gives you perfect privacy comparable to Zcash, or even better than Monero, actually. In Monero, you have like anonymity sets, which are sufficiently large but it's still like from a theoretical perspective um, a bit inferior to um, just like having the entire system as an anonymity set mm -hmm. and the second thing is that um, these snarks or like zk snarks um, like the, the, these these zero knowledge proofs they have that nice property that they compress very well i keep saying that it's actually a compression technique mm -hmm. um, that's a bit of a metaphor because there's no, no way to decompress it. Uh, yeah. If I give you that snark, you can just decompress the data from it. But um, Yeah, informationally, theoretically, you're destroying the information rather yeah. than actually compressing it. Yeah, you compress way beyond the information theoretical limits of compression. Mm -hmm. But um, what you're actually compressing is the verification, right? Like I give you, like you verify a bunch of data and then I give you like a receipt of the verification of the data. Mm -hmm. And um, that is miraculously efficient like you can compress gigabytes of data into a succinct proof that is less than a megabyte um, it's, it's quite astonishing that it's actually possible 
Mm -hmm. And long story short, you can use that magical technique to compress um, the coin history into a succinct proof of negligible size. And then I just sent you that proof and then you verify the proof and that is as good as verifying the entire history of the proof. And, you know, obviously <clears throat> this gives us you know, massive scaling and privacy wins, like you said, but it does really kind of fundamentally alter the way that people interact with Bitcoin. Yes. So, like it's right now, at least for on-chain Bitcoin, like it's completely stateless. Like as long as I keep my single seed back up, I'll always be able to recover the state of my coin, like be able to produce what I need to spend them. But with this kind of scheme, like keeping that relevant information totally off chain, like if you lose that, there there is no regenerating that data in the same way you can a set of private keys. Yes, that's one of the fundamental drawbacks of that um, approach. That uh, yeah, definitely backups are extremely critical, more critical than in the protocols that we are used to even more critical than in Lightning. In Lightning, you could still like collaborate with your channel, um, with your channel partner. And um, if, if they agree, then you can just close it even if you don't know the, uh, the, the fraud proof transactions. Mm -hmm. And um, here, that's not possible at all. Like, they, um, the backups become super critical, yes. So what, what's your thinking in terms of how like to approach dealing with that, um, especially from like a, a user's point of view, if we were to kind of move in this direction long term, as far as like where we want to go with scaling and, and really improving Bitcoin. Yeah, of course, you need like some backbone network of servers that redundantly store your backups, essentially. They are or like you trust that one of them is, is honest and will give you um, your backup if you need it. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to trust them in terms of privacy or something because you can simply encrypt your backup and they won't learn anything from you. Yeah, you have to trust that one of them is honest. Of course, you can also use classical cloud services. You could use Google Cloud or whatever. You don't leak much privacy. Of course, Google could try to analyze and could identify that there is that this is a, a backup of that particular protocol, but um, they don't learn anything else from it. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that this actually works out in practice. Of course, it, it is an issue. Um, it is a UX hurdle. And uh, in the beginning, I said we want to make UX better, mm -hmm. and in that sense, we'll make it worse. But um, I think it's um, it's worth a try. And um, uh, I think the, the improvements kind of justify this. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, it's it's a trade-off. Like, you, you don't get anything for free yeah. <laughs> in a space like this. Yeah, I, I, I like the the kind of aspect of it. It's, it's just purely opt-in like Lightning. Like, the yeah. reality is if you don't want to deal with those trade-offs or are kind of skeptical of them at first, like, people can build and use these systems. And you, you can just keep using on-chain or Lightning or whatever system you want to use and just see, like, how this system evolves. Yeah. over time in terms of safety, uh, resiliency. It's also an important point to make it compatible with Lightning because um, here you still essentially rely on on-chain transactions. So uh, you have that uh, settlement time of Bitcoin. So one block every 10 minutes or something. Mm -hmm. um, and to have instant finality, you would need something like payment channels. And ideally you would make it yeah, compatible with the Lightning Network such that um, you use the Lightning Network as like the central settlement layer. Mm -hmm. Maybe to mention a couple other Cool things about the protocol is, um, first of all, you can have um, uh, reusable addresses. So I have just a single address and I can post it out on my Twitter profile or whatever. And uh, everybody can send me money to that address and it doesn't reveal anything about it. It doesn't harm my privacy at all. Nobody can figure out my transaction history from that identifier. Another cool thing in comparison to these other client-side validation protocols is that you can pay fees in tokens. Or maybe I should mention in general that this is a token protocol but um, we can have BTC on it. Mm -hmm. That's actually why I'm working on BitVM to um, bridge Bitcoin into ZK coins or into client-side validation protocols. So we can have private Bitcoin, but you could also have a stable coin on there. And um, most other pro token protocols also on Ethereum, it's, it's very common that um, if I send you Tether on Ethereum, then you first need ETH to be able to transfer that Tether. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for pretty much every token protocol on top of Bitcoin. And uh, here in our protocol, um, we, we get rid of that um, such that you can pay fees 
directly in, in that token. So either in Tether or in your privacy Bitcoin, which um, is also better for privacy since you don't need any auxiliary um, UTXO to, to, to pay your fees. Mm -hmm. I know this is like a really mature proposal at this point, but the space has kind of gotten to the point where I'm scrambling <laughs> to, to keep abreast of everything going on. Um, have any of you, um, you, Liam, or uh, Jonas, like started working at any implementation? Yeah, my team at ZeroSync, we um, implemented a proof of concept prototype um, just, I think, four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we are working on um, launching it on, on Testnet within the next couple of weeks. And um, hopefully within that year, we will also have like a first reckless mainnet version. Awesome. So if we got BitVM in feature freeze and work moving towards an actual CSV implementation, maybe we actually see something live in the next few years? I hope that we can go live on mainnet within this year. Okay. Well, Probably like a, a simplified version, but uh, mm -hmm. I want to get it into the into the wild as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah it's just, you know, th these days I'm kind of torn <laughs> between pessimism and optimism because it, it just seems like impossible to actually accomplish any of the clean, simple improvements. But despite that, you know, we, we keep coming up with more roundabout ways to at least get an equivalent to, to something. So it's, it's kind of a mixed bag these days. Well, there's that saying that there is no rational alternative to optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Well, um, you have any like final comments or words you want to leave anybody with? Everybody should help make Bitcoin cypherpunk again. Bitcoin yeah. is a currency. That's what it's about. The store of value thing is just uh, to lurk the rich people into it. <laughs> but it's a currency. It's cypherpunk money. Freedom money. That's what it's about. Could not have said it better myself. So thanks for sitting down with me. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. All right. Take care, everybody.